Hi, everyone. Uh, I should just say straight away, if you end up Googling the mask project, spelt as it is there, you'll end up on a very uh, masculine-centered website that has nothing to do with archaeology whatsoever. Um, we probably need a rebranding exercise, uh, so be careful. Mass project in archaeology. Um, I'm glad to be following Pau because we're sort of going along the same lines. There's citizen science, community archaeology, trying to record coastal archaeology that's been damaged by winter storms. But we're very much a new kid on the block. We've been going for about six months or so. And this talk isn't so much about the sites that we've discovered, it's more about the people that we're engaging with, trying to interact with, as we're building a network of, of volunteers. Um, I hope you can all read that. The, the main problems uh, we face in Ireland has been uh, both financial uh, and the weather. So the winter storms of the past couple of years have completely decimated some of our coastal archaeology. We've had forts falling into the sea. We've had middens completely eroded away. We've lost a lot of land. About 250 acres of land have been lost over the uh, past few years. Uh, coupled with the economic recession that we've had uh, over the last best part of a decade now, our archaeological service, their budget has been slashed. Uh, there are only six archaeologists in the country that are uh, responsible for monument protection. So they'll go out, they go out across Ireland uh, and respond to the threats and damages uh, to archaeological monuments from winter storms and from other causes as well. So they've got an awful lot to, to cope with. Um, this graph was supplied by Pauline Gleeson from the National Monument Service in Ireland and it just gives you an idea of how many uh, responses uh, and reports of weather-related archaeological incidents there have been. And you can see the impact of the winter storms from 2014-2013 uh, from uh, there. It shot right up, uh, way off the scale. Uh, and because of that, we've sort of stepped in to, to create the, the MASK project to try and fill a gap as such. The main uh, issue with legislation in Ireland is the fact that it's a legal requirement for members of the public to report archaeological finds, so finds and objects, and they must be reported uh, within 96 hours. Now, most members of the public are completely unaware of this law, um, and again, it's a role that we can fulfill by making people aware of this. They're also looking at extending the legislation to monuments as well as fines, but at the moment, it's just fines. If you come across a find or a monument, you're supposed to fill in a monument report form. It's designed more for an archaeologist, I suppose, that's uh, actually familiar with archaeological terminology and so forth. Somebody that knows how to use a GPS and can put in accurate coordinates and so forth. Not necessarily uh, a member of the public who is very familiar with this type of reporting. So again, it's a role that we can play uh, in terms of this. So we've started the monitoring the archaeology of uh, Sligo's coastline project. Sligo, let's go off video for a minute, is just up here in the northwest uh, of Ireland. It's um, a fairly small area. Uh, it's got uh, a coastline that's manageable uh, for us in terms of how we can actually cope with it uh, and respond easily to it. Um, it's a citizen science project that we're setting up for the very first time. And the idea, along the lines of uh, the alert and citizen project that we'll probably hear about later today, it's to recruit volunteers give them some archaeological training, make them aware of the dangers of coastal erosion to our, uh, vulnerable archaeological sites, and then to verify what they found. Is it archaeology? Isn't it? Go out into the field, respond to it, verify it, and then get it recorded by the National Monument Service, <coughs> rather than the National Monument Service responding to every single call out they get. So it's a way of acting as a quality control. Uh, so Sligo, as I said, northwest uh, of Ireland, uh, this is our Google map uh, image. Uh, we, we need to migrate our database at the moment uh, over to, uh, to a proper GIS. Google maps are useful for us at the moment simply because it means we can go out to schools, libraries, roadshows. As long as we've got an internet access, we can show people where the archaeological sites, everything is color coded, um, where they are and get them more involved in their own local community. So we need to migrate that to a sort of web friendly GIS system really. Uh, so these are all the archaeological sites within 5 to 10 metres of the coastline. So these are our most vulnerable sites. Uh, Sligo in Irish, uh, it means uh, the shelly place, a place of uh, abundance of shells. And that reflects the number of middens that we have all around County Sligo. Uh, and one in four of our coastal archaeological sites are middens. We also have a number of promontory forts as well. 
Uh, we've got 195 kilometres of soft uh, of coastline, uh, and 132 kilometres of that is soft coastline, and that's where we're seeing most of our archaeological features. So we started the monitoring the archaeology of Sligo's coastline project to try and encourage citizen scientists to come forward uh, and record uh, archaeology where they find it on the beaches and so forth. The biggest issue we face, well there are two issues, the main one though is we have no funding whatsoever. Um, so we're trying to engage as many local stakeholders, volunteers, citizen scientists, our own students uh, from IT Sligo as well, to try and build up a network of people so that we can report it uh, and also give a bit of knowledge transfer and enhance people's training and so forth as well. The second issue we face is uh, land ownership. There's no right to roam in Ireland. Uh, in the UK, for those of you that have come from further than, the, than England, Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland, uh, we have right to roam in the UK, which essentially means you can walk in any field pretty much within reason. Uh, in Ireland, we, we don't have that as such. Um, so any land that's above the high water mark is in private ownership, which means we can record archaeology in a section almost, just sort of standing behind it, taking photographs, making drawings and so forth. Uh, and doing laser scans, but we can't go above and beyond that. Once we do that, we're on private land. However, the National Monument Service themselves actually have something called power of entry, which means they can go and visit any archaeological site or any area where they think there's an archaeological site, and they don't need the landowner's consent. Power of entry is something that not even the, the Irish police force have in full uh, on this basis as well. Um, so. There are issues that can be got around, but it really needs to be known about and reported uh, in the first place. So we've been considering who's actually using our coastlines, who's using the beaches and so forth, uh, and in that case, who we can interact with. So you've got lots of people on the beach, from dog walkers, leisure walkers, people doing water sports, kayaking, swimming, picnicking, bird watching, lots of local groups and so forth as well that we can interact with. In Sligo, we're quite lucky. We've got lots of special areas of conservation, her her natural heritage areas, uh, special protection areas. And again, these sort of things attract bird watchers, whale and dolphin groups, seal watching groups, lots of people who are using the beaches and coasts uh, for their own purposes. Most importantly, though, they're returning to the same spots, might be on a monthly basis, might be on a seasonal basis, but they are effectively monitoring the coastline. So they're more likely to spot any archaeology that pops up uh, due to winter storms and so forth. Uh, we had our origins at the Weather Beaten Archaeology Conference that we hosted in Sligo. Uh, many of you uh, that are here today were there as well. Um, this was great for us in terms of local and national media coverage because it got us out there. It actually told people on the ground what we were up to and that we were recruit recruiting citizen scientists. Within about two weeks of the conference, we were invited to take part in a Clean Coasts Roadshow. Now, Clean Coasts is this fantastic organisation in Ireland that basically recruits volunteers all across uh, the Irish coastline and gets them to do beach cleans, two minute beach clean, a 10 minute beach clean. Everyone gets together, they pick up a load of rubbish. And these have been an absolutely uh, key uh, network for us because they're mon literally monitoring their own section of beaches uh, every few weeks and they're very likely to, to notice archaeological changes. Uh, there are over, if you look at the, the Google map up here, 451 of these clean coast groups, volunteer groups, all across the country. Uh, in Sligo, we've got 31, 32 uh, different groups, uh, sorry, 51 different groups. Uh, and in response to the, the soft coastline that we have, that means there's about one group for every 2.6 kilometers of the Sligo coastline. So these are people that are going out very, very regularly capable of spotting cigarette butts, crisp packets, sweets, this sort of thing, and picking it up. If they're able to spot that, they're able to spot archaeology. And because they're going out regularly, they're going to notice any significant changes that are there as well. So the Clean Coast group have been an absolute key network uh, for us. Uh, the volunteer labour that's put in, if we calculate it for the minimum wage, they actually contribute about half a million euros worth uh, to the Irish economy. So it's a massive force and network. Uh, this was on their Facebook page a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's a 15-year-old crisp packet. So it just illustrates the fact that they are picking up archaeology. It's just yesterday's archaeology. So it's not a great extension for them to consider, well, this is a bit older litter, uh, but essentially it's archaeology. So we can get them on board uh, and get them quite excited about it. 
So now I'm just going to introduce you to the men and women behind the MASS project um, and give you a few examples of, of how we've been doing this. So again, within a few weeks of that Clean Coast Roadshow where we first promoted uh, the MASS project, we were contacted by Martina. She's a kayaker. She runs her own Clean Coast group that goes up and down the coastline in kayaks, pulls over, does their own bit of cleaning, picking up beach litter and so forth. Uh, and they were out one day at a place called Ross's Point and they spotted what they thought might be a midden. They weren't too sure, they're not archaeologists. All they saw was a, a very uh, horizontal deposit of, of shells there. They contacted us by our email, sent us a few photographs, uh, and just said, what do you think? Is this archaeology? Are you aware of it already? We're not really sure. It's an area that's been very, very badly eroded. And this is the start of our VGI, our Volunteer Geographic Information. So once they're sending us photographs, especially any photographs sent by a, a smartphone, we've got a GPS tag on that, so we know exactly where each of these uh, points are. So we went out, we were able to send one of our local archaeologists out to respond to it, to do a quality check as such, uh, and they were able to say, yes, it is archaeology, uh, and we can start getting the ball rolling. So the first thing we decided to do was we would have a very uh, adept feedback loop where we're giving back information to the citizen science scientists constantly. So the first thing was, yep, thank you very much. It certainly looks like archaeology based on the photograph that you've submitted. We're going to check the records. So we look on archaeology.ie, which contains all the recorded monuments in Ireland. Have a look on there. No, nope, there's no archaeology on there. That would suggest it's probably new. Then we get our responder out. He goes and has a look. We respond back. Yep, he's taken some photographs. This is very likely to be archaeology. Then we get to report it to the National Monument Service, and eventually they pop out and they formally record it. So it is archaeology after all. At the same time, we're developing uh, this uh, link uh, for a Google form, essentially, where we're collecting very basic information. So Martina was very happy because she's now got uh, an archaeological site uh, that she can show her friends. It's on the archaeology.ie. It's got the sexy title of SL008-203. It's a red dot, though. She can look on the map. She can say, look, these are all the monuments uh, in Sligo. That red one is mine. There it is. You can see, just out of interest, the amount of erosion that must have taken place, because this is in an area of green space. It's a good 10, 15 meters in. So a massive amount of erosion uh, involved before that was exposed. So it's got the unsexy title of SL008 dash dash dash. We just call it Martina's Midden. And so we promoted it. We wrote a blog that brought in more publicity. And basically, we're giving our citizen scientists ownership of their monuments. Because it's not every day, as an archaeologist, we're a bit blasé. Oh, we've discovered more archaeology. That's our job. That's what we do. Citizen scientists, they're not used to that. If they discover an archaeological site, that's really important. It's something they want to shout about. She's obviously going to share that with her friends. It raises awareness. We get into the local papers and so forth. And again, more and more people are aware of it. And it's driving the publicity and increasing the awareness. Martina, as uh, our first citizen scientist, was also able to, to help us with our, our Google form, how we actually report it. So we were asking her lots of questions, how she recorded it, uh, what she felt could be there, uh, but also how do you describe it? Uh, for a non-archaeologist describing the amount of shells, charcoal, uh, any other types of finds as well, they're not going to be sitting out there with a ruler and measuring in inches or centimeters, so we're saying, is it bigger than your finger, is it bigger than your hand, this sort of thing. So we were able to get a lot of feedback on our Google form from the citizen scientist and actually develop that as we went along. So from all of these things, from the Weatherbeaten Conference, uh, from the Clean Coast Roadshow, from our own work at IT Sligo, we've started developing these networks. And the networks are now leading to discoveries. We've been going for six months. The key thing, I think, is we've got about four discoveries. There's a few more that aren't mentioned on there. And we're not even into the winter storm period yet. We're expecting really nothing to be discovered uh, until sort of October, November, when the storms really kick up. We've actually been getting things in since April, May, June, all the way through the summer. So it, it just demonstrates it's not necessarily a winter problem when the strong surges are there. Um, it, it's all year round, essentially. So we keep developing these networks and finding more and more people. Uh, and everything leads on to something else. So through our publicity, there's a chap who set up a drone company on the other side of Ireland. He's just interested in generating a bit of publicity for himself, for his new company at the minute. He's going out to various uh, sites and other areas of interest, taking lots of really nice uh, drone imagery. 
Um, and he's able, obviously, to access sites that we can't. We can't stand on the foreshore and access something like this. It's far too dangerous. But the drone imagery that we get from this is really, really important. It's adding an awful lot to our archaeological record. We then have the Grange Armada and Development Association. Three ships uh, were sunk uh, during the retreat of the Spanish Armada off the Irish coast, specifically off the, the Sligo coast at a place called Streda. Uh, this development association has been publicizing it for a, a long time, and they frequently work with the National Monument Service. That means they, they speak and they understand archaeology. Uh, so what they're doing is they've started raising with the National Monument Service uh, various finds from the Spanish Armada, things that are being picked up, uh, and carefully conserved. And they've got a history of doing this because they've been monitoring this part of the coastline for a large number of years. They're used to finding the timbers, and whilst getting a timber out of the water, standing around and taking a photograph of it, isn't fantastic, they actually have a procedure that they follow. If they find a timber, they're getting the location of it, they're immediately putting it into a local pool uh, uh, and getting it preserved until the National Monument Service can actually pick it up. Uh, we have Tamlin here, who's from a commercial archaeological company, uh, and she's able to go out and give advice uh, to people like the Grange Armada Association on what to do with waterlogged timbers. And she's also finding her own coastal archaeological features as well. We have Oriel, who runs a, a guiding, a tour guiding uh, around the Sligo coast, mountain climbing, uh, hill walking, uh, horse riding, all sorts of things. Again, she's going out, she's recording things as she's going because she's going to the same beaches and so forth with different tours on a very regular, weekly, monthly basis. So again, she's going to notice any changes. And again, she and Tamlin both run their own clean coasts thing. Uh, so each of these clean coast groups have very strong links with archaeologists. Sally, one of our students, is out walking a dog on her local beach and she's finding exposed peat shells. Uh, so we're able to go out and record those as well and start mapping them. Uh, Kieran, we attach a GPS and a camera to him and he goes out and finds lots of archaeological sites. There's another image missing here, we won't worry about that. But he's finding all sorts of things, uh, lots of exposed peats, uh, trackways, uh, and this monument, uh, a full of fear uh, that we'll talk about in a second. Stuart is a postgraduate who's just started work on uh, signal towers, coastal Napoleonic signal towers around the coast of Ireland. Again, it's about getting out to islands, uh, discovering very remote archaeology as well. Uh, myself and Marion Dowd have been responsible for digging or accessing this uh, full of fear trough that's submerged. Uh, it's intertidal. Uh, we've just uh, put it in for publication, so I won't say too much about it. But we were out there a couple of months ago mapping the intertidal area. Uh, with the GPS, and we discovered that since last year's excavation, not only is there a fullock there, there's also a burnt spread of stones. Here's the fullock, a burnt spread of stones, and a midden complex, all within 25 meters uh, of the area. And this has been exposed since last year's excavation. So this is constantly happening, and it's happening again during the summer months. Uh, we've also been working in the Shelley Valley, another midden complex uh, with the University of, uh, of Georgia in Athens in the US uh, to map, thank you, uh, to map midden complexes and halves. We're carrying out geophysics and coring there. Uh, just to go back to our Google form and how we actually develop things uh, with our VGI data. We're not certain whether we're going to uh, develop it with an, an app. Uh, it's something we want to look at, but the time and the expense of that, we're not familiar with how we're going to do that. Uh, just saying we know a little bit about our citizen scientists, where they come from, what they do, based on these Google Forms so that we can actually uh, have a better way of tracing and interacting with these people. In terms of the post data collection, what we would emphasize essentially is giving feedback back to the citizen scientists as being the number one priority, as that actually means we can build up more networks of interested people. Uh, and I will leave it here as such. Uh, just to build up, uh, this is what we're going to be doing in the future, building up our training, uh, raising more awareness, they're all feeding into one another. The awareness, the outreach, the publicity, the roadshows, going into libraries and schools, speaking to local groups, that raises the awareness. We then have the beginnings of training and a knowledge transfer that encourages the citizen scientists. And then the rest of the MAS project, it's driven by research and commercial projects. So it's not, not so much a top-down approach. We're gathering data uh, from everybody else. And I will leave it there. Thank you.